hello everyone. Welcome to Remaking the Tudors. This is another event in our public event series, Tudors Now, here at the Paul Mellon Centre and online. So welcome to those of you in the room and to those of you listening in um, online. The Tudor century witnessed developments across a huge variety of cultural areas, including politics, gender, national identity and race. It was a period when women were seen as inferior to men, but when two queens reigned, when black people lived and worked free of systematic racial oppression, but which also saw the development of colonial ambitions and the birth of the transatlantic slave trade. The Tudor period's contradictions and uh, complications combined with its vivid imagery make it an ongoing source of fascination for contemporary artists. And in this session, artists working across a variety of media and a curator will discuss the inspiration that Tudor art and culture um, hold for them. So due to family illnesses, sadly, Chan, Hyo, Bai and the Singh twins are unable to join us this evening. But we're delighted that Emily Hanam has been able to step in on behalf of the Singh twins and present their artwork. So joining us tonight are Matt Collishaw, one of the most significant and compelling artists in contemporary British art. Following his training at Goldsmiths College, Matt formed part of the legendary movement of young British artists. He was one of 16 young artists who participated in the seminal Freeze exhibition organised by Damien Hirst in 1988, as well as the provocative Sensation Show of 1997 at the Royal Academy in London. Throughout his 30-year career, he has contemplated the nature of the human subconscious and explored ways to influence it through various media. Through optical illusions, paintings, projections, and moving sculptures, Matt creates works and scenarios that directly and unconsciously engage their viewers. The works encourage us to think about fundamental questions of psychology, history, sociology, and science. And behind the richness and visual appeal of each work, there is a deep exploration of how we perceive and are influenced by the world today through images and modern technology. Questions regarding behavioural manipulation, programming and temporal reality all linger in the viewing experience. We also have Peter Brathwaite, a British opera singer who works across different art forms to excavate and platform suppressed stories and voices. In addition to performing on major international opera stages, he devises his own theatre productions. Peter has been shortlisted for a Royal Philharmonic Society Award and his collaborative work has won a Laurence Olivier Award. His photographic series has been exhibited by King's College London and the Wellcome Trust and the British Stull Museum and Art Gallery. As a broadcaster for BBC Radio 3, he has authored and presented programmes on black portraiture and the cultural legacy of enslavement in Barbados. He's written for The Guardian and The Independent and is a prominent speaker on performance, identity and restorative justice in the arts. The Singh Twins are internationally renowned, award-winning contemporary British artists whose work, which challenges narrow Eurocentric perceptions of art, heritage and identity, has been described by Sir Simon Sharma as representing the artistic face of modern Britain. Formal recognition includes an MBE, three honorary doctorates and honorary citizenships of Liverpool for their outstanding contribution to contemporary art. Referring to their art as past modern, the twins have had solo exhibitions, including contemporary connections, the Singh Twins at the National Portrait Gallery in London, curated in response to the Tudor collection there, and the Singh Twins Slaves of Fashion, which includes references to the Tudors in connection with narratives of empire and colonialism. And speaking on their behalf tonight is Emily Hannam, um, historian and curator of South Asian art. She has held curatorial uh, positions at the Royal Collection and the British Museum and will be joining the Asia Department at the V&A later this summer. She commissioned a new work from the Singh Twins for an exhibition of South Asian art at the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace in the summer of 2018 and more recently worked with the Twins on a mural commission for Manchester Museum's South Asia Gallery, um, a British Museum partnership gallery that opened in February this year. She was also an advisor on the exhibition Beyond the Page, South Asian Miniature Painting and Britain from 1600 to Now at MK Gallery, which is curated by the PMC's own Hamad Nassar and that runs from October this year until January uh, 2024. And that will also feature the work of the Singh Twins. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, Each person is now going to speak for about 10 minutes about an artwork and then we will move to a roundtable discussion. Hi, everybody. 
Uh, I'm Matt Collishaw. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm a visual artist. I work with a very wide range of media. I didn't study art history. I studied fine art. And everything I've really picked up on the history of sculpture and paintings is through just looking at books, looking at uh, documentaries, and it's things that interest me intuitively. So I don't really have any kind of structured background in the history of fine art. I I stumble through and I'm drawn to working with various paintings from the past as well as various historical ideas and I try to incorporate, incorporate them in my arts, usually harnessing them with some kind of modern technology, digital technology, and I try to make the artwork like a bridge between ideas and images that have happened in the past and where we're going and where we are currently with the the, the, the deluge of technology which we live uh, within. And a lot of the artworks that I've taken and incorporated into the works that I make generally come from the Baroque period, not a conscious decision. It's just that that period appeals to me more perhaps because it's more emotive, there's more drama in there, the lighting is more seductive and atmospheric. And I haven't really focused at all on the Tudor period, and I'm not exactly sure why you thought I should come along and, and talk here this evening, because I am by no means an expert. Probably everybody in the room knows more on the subject than I do. And I, but I did make this one work a couple of years ago, uh, 2018, I think it was, where I was invited by the Queen's House down in Greenwich to make an artwork which responded to the renovation of the Armada portrait, probably the most iconic portrait of Elizabeth I. And for several years, this painting had been cleaned and it was about to come back out on show in its new vibrant form. And I found it very difficult to look at an image which was like on initial impression, so obviously a propaganda portrait with all its majesty, all its pageantry, and was also visually very flat. It was not the kind of painting that was normally drawn to, uh, which 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 would evoke things within me, which I then thought I could go on to use within the artwork. I also tend to gravitate towards artworks which are surrounded by black. So it's just like a formal mechanism. It makes it a lot easier for me to reframe these things. Obviously, that happens a lot more in the Baroque period than it does in the Tudor period. I didn't really know how I was going to make an inroad on this uh, amazing painting of the Armada portrait or how I would approach any other painting from the from the Tudor canon. So I started reading a lot around the subject, and reading several books on Elizabeth I, and absorbing the whole era, and uh, hoping that it might somehow marinate and, uh, and, and turn it into some kind of an idea that I could use to create an artwork that was like um like a prism in some way and it reflected all those ideas that i had had when, when looking at this painting and it was it was very obvious uh from spending any amount of time in front of it that this very flat looking painting so like all the geometry seems to be flattened out the light is very even there's no real consistent shadows coming from one particular direction and the whole surface of the painting is embroidered with this very rich detail of things which are trying to tell you stuff. They're little triggers. They're all designed to indicate certain things about the status of the Queen, about the status of England of a, as a nation. So the little jewel boxes, this heavily starched collar, the, the scepter and the globe, which she has her hand on, the windows at the back behind her showing the, the armada, out of the back. All of these things are like little triggers. And so I was, I'm thinking that this whole propaganda portrait is designed to manipulate us in some way. It's this, this artifice that is there to tell us to think certain things, generally about the, the great majesty of the queen, to suggest that she has something immortal about her, and now that body politic relates to the health of the nation that we've got this young, strong, powerful, beautiful, richly adorned queen as our figurehead. 
And what happened during the renovation was very interesting in my thought process in trying to make something about it because a lot of the the varnishes and the, the candle smoke that had accumulated over the years had been cleaned off and the colors were a lot a lot more varied and vibrant than they were in the in the images that we were used to seeing which were a lot a lot more monochromatic and a lot browner suddenly you had a lot more beautiful delicate colors in there but certain things in the painting were left, such as these two uh, maritime paintings in the background, which were painted like uh, a significant time after the original painting was made. And they x-rayed the painting and they could see kind of what was going off on beneath these maritime portraits, maritime paintings, but they decided to leave them on. And this is like adding another layer of deception to this already highly choreographed image. So we've got this portrait of Queen Elizabeth I. She's 55 years old. The painting was made in 1588. The Queen herself was heavily adorned with makeup. She's wearing very thick uh, a, a face powder, face cream. She had smallpox scarring, apparently, from quite an early age, so she'd want to cover that up. This, this, this powder that she was applying to her face had lead content in it, so the lead was like eating into the, the lead was devouring her face as it was on their function as this kind of mask. She was also using various other devices to create this mask-like image, which she presented to the public. In, in addition to the way that she was kind of building a mask around her own face to kind of idealize her features, the painting had many, many different things that were going on, which were all telling you to think in a, and respond to the picture in a certain way. So for me, this picture worked as like a series of layers which were all playing with reality. They were all kind of ways of trying to manipulate and manipulate us in our understanding of what the truth was. So the artwork that I finished up making was this um, mask of the Queen. And it was a portrait of the Queen as she actually would have looked in 1588 if she wasn't uh, covered in, in this makeup and she wasn't idealized in the way that the painter depicted her in the portrait. So I, I, I created the... the the artwork by, first of all, laser scanning this effigy of the Queen, which is at the National Portrait um, Gallery. This was made in 1603, just after she died. So she was a little bit older than she was in uh, 1588. But we could establish some basic geometry of her features, like what her, what her nose was like, how her cheekbones, how her brow uh, was constructed. And those were all basics that wouldn't have changed that much. We then scanned every image that we could find, paint, oil paintings, watercolors, etc., and then did a lot of work with computers trying to establish the biometrics, the distance between her eyes, the length of her nose, and all those, all that information that we'd need to rebuild her portrait. And at the same time, we're taking the effigy scan, which is like a three-dimensional virtual scan of the Queen, and trying to reverse age it so she's back to the age of about 55 years old. And when we've done this, we 3D print like a little mask. And uh, then I started working with an animatronics guy and he was building all the little mechanisms which go behind the masks and which trigger it to move and behave in certain ways. Uh, in the reading that I'd done around Queen Elizabeth, I mean, I had a little bit of knowledge about her bef before, as everybody does. Um, but what or seemed to be very pertinent about this artwork that I was trying to make here was the fact that she had to present this mask-like appearance to the public, like literally and metaphorically. She was a woman in a man's world. There's a lot of people who wanted her out of the way, Catholics and a lot of other people. So she was extremely vulnerable in her position. She had to pro project this image to the public, this image of strength and youth and vigor and autonomy, independence, and all of those things was this carapace that she had to hide behind so that she could main her, maintain her position. And I think there were only five portraits of the Queen that were made at the time that she was alive. 
All the other paintings, of which there are many, were made from other paintings by her. So there's a lot of a lot of difficulty establishing what she did look like. And she had she introduced a mechanism called the Mask of Youth, which was basically like a template of how she should be depicted. And if anybody strayed too far from that template, then the images would be destroyed, burnt. Um, so she, so she, so her image was very carefully controlled, and for me, she was like the the first great, like a pioneer of the propaganda portrait of like that. This is um, this is a way of manipulating an image of me and presenting it as an an icon, which will live on in people's minds. Um, so the mask of youth was the name of the artwork, and it's all controlled by these little uh, mechanisms, gears, and electrical components and motors that are behind her. And then the whole thing is installed on like a two-way surveillance mirror, the kind of things that you find in airports where the security guys are behind the mirror. They can see you very clearly, but you on the other side can only see this mirror. So there she is, and she's kind of floating and marooned on this, this surface of the mirror, this unreliable manipulator of truth through reflection. And her, her movements are all controlled by these mechanisms that she that she, that she is behind this, this mask shape, this, this mask of youth, which although it depicts her face it is, as a mask, hopefully reveals a little bit more about her the bad teeth and the hair and a bit of the small box coring, reveals the real queen at that age, but in mask format. And that the mechanisms behind her are all the things that she had to adopt in order to survive in this very brutal world that she was in. It was all going on beneath the surface. Um, and I think I've probably done about my 10 minutes now. Okay, so thank you very much. Hi there, it's good to see you all. Um, I'm going to start by reading an excerpt from my book. Uh, the image you can see is in the first part of my book, and I'm going to read the caption. A drummer painted in around the 1530s by Christoph Weiditz I, a German artist. A black drummer playing at the ceremonial 1529 entrance of Emperor Charles V. It's taken from Weiditz's unpublished costume book, reworked with toilet paper, Grandpap's cuckoo stick, Granny's quilt, and a clothes horse. The inscription above the drummer says, Thus ride the army drummers in Spain when the emperor rides into a city. Vidits drew this black drummer when he accompanied Charles V through Aragon and Catalonia. The subject's earring and plumage are incredibly expressive accessories that would have made this portrayal a noteworthy and exotic addition to a manuscript of cultural difference. By this time, African people were visible in cosmopolitan courts across Europe, particularly in the Mediterranean region. There was also an established tradition of black musicians playing at European courts. Charles V's aunt, Catherine of Aragon, even brought black trumpeters to England in her entourage. I chose to sit in the drummer's saddle as part of the Getty Challenge. During lockdown, the Getty Museum in California, a museum with one of the largest collections in the world, encouraged people to recreate their favorite pieces of art, using only what they had to hand at home. They had to post the resulting homemade artwork on social media, and the challenge caught my attention during Easter week, so it was still fairly early in the lockdown experience. And by this point, I'd already experimented with several ways to fill my enforced free time. Having seen much of my singing work, operas and concerts disappear overnight. Uh, there was lots of cooking, no sourdough, but a game attempt to use up all those forgotten tins that were languishing in the back of the kitchen cupboards. We had tin pineapple with everything. I'd also decided to revisit my family tree research, begun the autumn before as a birthday gift for my mum, who's from Barbados. 
I was making progress. Hours of digging had taken me from the plantations of Barbados and across the Atlantic via a slave ship to 18th century Ghana. Meanwhile, my European DNA had taken me from Barbados back to 15th century Lancaster. I managed to connect with some distant cousins via an ancestry website, and a transatlantic video call with them uncovered even more insights into the lives of my African ancestors who were enslaved in the West Indies. Ancestors who'd been stripped of their humanity and reduced to status of property, chattel, memorialized only as stock in the slave registers, their sex, nationality, age, and plantation occupation were listed beneath the names of the great men who owned them. Their labor enabled these great men to produce sugar, the white gold that made them the wealthiest humans on the planet. So these sugar barons had their portraits painted. I've got PDFs of them, but I can only imagine my black ancestors from this time the more of their names I uncovered, the more this reality troubled and annoyed me. I read and read as much as I could, trying to piece together visually what they would have been like. And this was all on my mind when I first came across the Getty Museum Challenge. And scrolling through Twitter, my feed was awash with people who'd taken up the challenge, recreating their favorite artworks. It was a whitewash. Confirmation of how our understanding of art and history has been shaped to favor one reality above all others. Where were the paintings of black people? I knew they existed. I'd read Miranda Kaufman's Black Tudors. I knew about the image of Tudor musician John Blank. I also knew about the painting of Dido Bell, the mixed race woman who lived at London's Kenwood House in the 18th century. There had to be more. I decided to dip my toe into the Getty Challenge to prove this and to explore how my understanding of my own past has been shaped through the narratives of colonialism. I would use the challenge to rediscover the Black portraiture I already knew, find new ones, and highlight how Black people have been depicted over the centuries of Western art. I'd question how narratives have rewritten, subjugated, or excluded the history of black people. And I'd use everything but the kitchen sink to do it. So back to this musician, this drummer. Vyditz's vivid watercolor is more than a book about fashion history. For me, re-embodying an image like this is an opportunity to physicalize and understand what an eyewitness portrayal from this time was actually meant to achieve. This is a holistic portrayal focusing on a musician's body and actions, a black musician's body and actions. It's an example of how black individuals fit into social structures and aided this period's negotiation of identity and self. And when considered within the context of the book it's part of and other depictions included, it's difficult to avoid the suggestion that laborer or performer are the only possible roles for black people in European courts of the day. Fashionable accessories. You can almost imagine a Tudor monarch flicking through a, bo a book like the one this portrait is from and designing what their entourage should look like. And to paraphrase uh, Shakespeare scholar Farah Karim Cooper, um, although academic orthodoxy alleges race didn't exist at this time, therefore racism didn't exist. This just isn't true. The creation of racial identities about human difference has been developing since the Middle Ages. That being said, in this depiction, I see a skilled black drummer, more than capable of executing complex polyrhythms across two instruments, while seamlessly negotiating the up and down motion of riding or horse beats. I mentioned John Blank briefly, the only black Tudor for whom we have an attributable image. We also know that in the early 16th century, black musicians were high status, free members of the Scottish royal retinue, the so-called Peter the Moor 
being one, my namesake, and another known as the African drummer. Recreating this image was very much a performance for me, a jumping off point, one that as a British Barbadian musician catapulted me from the 1530s to the knotted language of the 1688 slave codes, the laws that governed the plantation society of the English colony of Barbados and cemented the notion that a black life was not a human life. These laws banned African music, specifically the beating of drums, for fear that drum signaling could be used in conjunction with revolts. In Barbados, music that had become social glue for enslaved people was driven underground. The complex West African rhythms, once described by Europeans as sounding like water dropping over a cliff onto a stone ledge, were now hidden behind the mask of European instruments. The seemingly English sounding music that developed exists in Barbados to this very day and is known as tuck music. My recreation, though quite silent, pays homage to those rebel sounds. My recreation also uses Barbadian cooking pots given to me by my mum. I use them as drums here. One of my drumsticks is the cuckoo stick my grandfather carved. It's used to make the national dish of Barbados. I use these objects because that's what I had to hand, but also because like the skills of music and drumming, foods serve as a touchstone of the experience of human migration. Like music, food gives expression to the ways migrants commemorate the past and shape new identities amid alien cultures. As a second generation immigrant, this image represents a diasporic fragment, a means by which I can connect with and reclaim the parts of my heritage that are intangible. The fundamental shapes, sounds, and rhythms that reverberate through our shared past. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Firstly, apologies that I am neither an award-winning British artist, um, nor was my sister available for a double act this evening. But I am delighted to be standing in here um, today for the Sing Twins, who I've known for many years. And I will endeavour to speak on their behalf for the next 10 minutes or so. The artwork that the Sing Twins chose to contribute to this discussion is titled Trade Wars, Elizabeth I. It is a mixed medium artwork combining both hand painted and digitally created imagery. And it was inspired by this portrait of Elizabeth I, sometimes referred to as the Pelican Portrait, which is in the collections of the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. And the Liverpool area is, of course, where the twins grew up and where they still live and work today. For context, trade wars is part of a wider body of work entitled Slaves of Fashion. This series explores the hidden histories and modern day legacies of empire and colonialism through the story of the trade of Indian textiles. This is depicted as a global story of conquest, conflict and enslavement connected to the wider history of global trade in luxury goods. Slaves of Fashion is divided into two parts. Firstly, there are a series of these life-size allegorical portraits, which focus on interconnected historic themes, all of which were actually inspired by objects selected from various museum and gallery collections, as well as historical archive material. And as well as these allegorical portraits, Slaves of Fashion comprises a number of contemporary perspective artworks, which pick up and expand on some of the historic themes depicted in the portraits, which as you can see here, include some very witty and satirical works quoting historic paintings and prints. And you can see here that these smaller works were displayed in the Slaves of Fashion exhibition in close proximity to these large allegorical portraits, which were um, as light boxes. And they're displayed to highlight the connections between past and present. 
aimed at revealing this ongoing impact and relevance of empire and colonialism today. In the exhibition, Trade Wars Elizabeth I was displayed next to this allegorical portrait titled Calico, Merchant Thieves, which explores the material Calico and how the East India Company came to be rulers of large parts of India. Trade Wars responds to one of the core themes of the Calico work, which is the relationship between trade and conflict during the time of Britain's conquest and colonialism of India and the centuries ever since. The Tudor portrait of Elizabeth I is one of the twins' favourite historic works. And they were keen to make connections between it and their portraits in the Slaves of Fashion series. They said, and I quote, that Elizabeth's sumptuous costume, depicted in such fine detail, representing expensive fabrics and dripping with precious stones, which were perhaps mined in India, made us think about the source of Tudor wealth and how that wealth was expressed elsewhere in the material culture of the Tudors as symbols and status of power. And I'm continuing their quote. For us, a key source of this wealth lay in the commerce of luxury commodities from the East, made possible through Elizabeth granting in 1600 a trade monopoly to the East India Company. We express this in our artwork by substituting some of Elizabeth's costume, decorations and adornments with spices, the nutmeg, cloves and pepper you see here, with cotton textiles and chintz, with coffee, sugar and rum, all consumer goods that were the preserve of the nobility in Tudor times. The fact that these goods were largely secured through the enslavement, exploitation and colonization of foreign lands made possible through military force and England's rising supremacy over the seas, which is said by some to have begun with Elizabeth's victory over the Spanish Armada, mm -hmm. is represented by the cannon and shackles, the East India Company ship, and a banner denoting British sugar plantation colonies in Jamaica. English, England's establishment in 1612 of a trading base at Surat, an important centre of commerce and manufacture on the west coast of India, which the East India Company seized control from their Western colonial rivals, the Portuguese, is represented by the imagery just below the banner in this work. And the ongoing relationship between trade, conflict and conquest connected to Indo-British as well as wider global history during later colonial periods and in more recent times is explored in the four corners of the space immediately surrounding the figure of Elizabeth. These include references to the Opium Wars, the annexation of Punjab, Zulu Wars, the battles of Plassey and Seringapatam in Bengal and Mysore, the Boston Tea Party and the American War of Independence, as well as conflicts of the 20th century in the Middle East over the control of oil and the Suez Canal. And, oh, sorry. and in 1984, you can just see at the top, Operation Blue Star was the Indian Army military attack on the Golden Temple in Amritsar, which, according to leaks, leaked secret documents, was supported by the British government, then keen to protect its lucrative trade in arms to India. In the outer borders, the theme of trade wars and consumerism is explored further, but this time within a modern context. Here, the decoration alludes to the repeated price slashing of certain goods by supermarkets in competition for the customer business upon which their profits and stock market value ultimately depend. Particular focus is given to the negative impacts of the price wars, both social and ecological, symbolized by bananas as top selling items for supermarkets and for a long time at the center of debates around fair trade and organic produce. At the top, you see a shopping trolley filled to the brim with cheap bananas which is supported by a banner representing the Sweet Fruit Bitter Truth campaign. This imagery reflects not only the growing call for more responsible and sustainable consumerism, but also how such campaigns highlight the fact that making informed choices about what to put into the shopping basket 
can help secure better working conditions, rights, and wages for those at the bottom of the supply chain. Other details of the artwork reveal how the history of large-scale corporate and government control of the banana industry through land grabbing, labor, exploitation, and the abuse of human rights all date back to colonial times. Now I'm going to end with two examples of how the Singh twins have subsequently incorporated their portrait of the queen from trade wars into other artworks from the Slave of Fashion series. So here, this is indigo, the color of India. And you can just see at the very bottom underneath the enslaved figure, here she represents the Tudor connection to trade along the Silk Road. And lastly, in their triptych artwork, Rule Britannia, Legacies of Empire, on the left, Queen Elizabeth represents the Tudor origins of the British Raj and Britain's ongoing relationship with India as a legacy of an empire whose foundations, as mentioned at the start, owes much to the Royal Charter, which Elizabeth I granted to the East India Company in 1600. Thank you. So um, my first question is, what can historical literacy do for artists? What are the benefits of a knowledge of art history? And are there also pitfalls? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Um, I'm going to have to try and feel my way around the answer here. But. I do use a lot of like contemporary media in the artworks that I make. I started working with photography initially because I didn't really know what to do with photography. So it was, I had to think more about what the content was going to be because I couldn't really control things about like the composition and the lighting and the color and all that. Anyway, so, and then the more I worked with it, the more involved that I got. And now I work with a lot of stuff with, with technology and Consequently, I go to see quite a few exhibitions that involve artists or collectives that use tech. And I always find it a little disappointing and dispiriting when these things are just like techie shows about tech and there's nothing in there that anchors me to the history of art and the history of ideas and that whole uh, huge treasure trove of images and sculptures, et cetera, that we have to draw on. And it appears to me that somehow it became unfashionable at some point in the 20th century to reference anything pre-modernism period. There was like a cutoff and that was it. And the pictorial inventiveness of the period between 15th century up until the 19th century was incredible. And I think it was partially due to the fact that a lot of artists didn't have total freedom when they were making an artwork, unlike we did in the 20th century, where we could, you know, create a square and put a kind of a couple of marks on it and say that it was a new form of art. Artists had a responsibility to whoever was paying them, whether it was the church or it was a merchant or an emperor, or it was a form of political propaganda. And in creating artworks that had to be both compelling and convincing to their patron and also function as an image to seduce whoever their patron wanted to intimidate and have power over it or seduce, they had to deliver on all those levels. Then also, if they were to be a truly great artist, like a Rubens or a Rembrandt, then they would have to put something in of their own as well. And they'd often have to sneak it in there because it wasn't going to be the main subject matter because they were making a portrait of a merchant or whatever it was. And so all of those devices that they had to use, along with the fact that they had to use their skills in geometry and composition and lighting and color, in order to create something that, that sold the job in terms of like the, the patron that they were trying to deliver for, all of those little things that advertising uses nowadays, all of those little tricks. They had to master those techniques and then slip in their own little message. So all of that stuff, I think, is like it's tragic if we if we lose it. And so with the work that I try to do, I try to draw on all of those things because they are just 
outstandingly good at the job they do, whether they were kind of ethically or morally correct in promoting a certain job or a certain king or a certain emperor is obviously questionable. And I like to think that I try to deal with those things as well about the power dynamic and the manipulation that goes on when you present images to people because they are means of seduction and manipulation. Um, and I think art with, that involves technology should have those things in it. And it gives gives like a kind of a, a grounding and a ballast and a gravity to the work when it does reference these these amazing traditions from the past. Does that go anywhere near the question? Absolutely. Thank you. And I think particularly with your work, um, Matt, the uh, the interest in robotics and I mean, the, the idea of the automaton in the 16th century is a really big part of the kind of court artifice that you're talking about. I mean, Elizabeth I's astrologer, uh, John Dee, had a reputation for being a magician and a necromancer, partly because he'd made some kind of stage automaton when he was a student at university, a scarab beetle that flew across the stage, apparently under its own um, power. And uh, although he insisted he'd only done this using mathematics, in fact, um, everyone accused him of being of, of sort of in, somehow harnessing a demon to make it go. So I think the kind of although you do show us the the workings of the the mask in in a way, I certainly for me, with someone with no real knowledge of how robotics sort of works, there's still a mystery and a magic to it that is it's a sort of conscious artifice, but it still doesn't quite tell me everything I need to know about how it's moving. It's they are they are they are kind of eerie and sinister to see something and there is that thing called the uncanny valley right which is this thing where something is so like human like but you know it's not human it makes you feel kind of nauseous sick because there's something wrong there there's something deeply chilling and i wanted to make a comment about the fact that you know these this these portraits that we make for ourselves are, are designed as masks and it's something that's prevalent today like back in the 16th century 15th century it was only like kind of very wealthy people who could make portraits of themselves now everybody's got an iphone and they can add filters and all of those things that are happening in this cosmetification of the image everyone's doing it on their phone and they're putting it out and they're choreographing their appearance on social media which is kind of great because you can look amazing feel confident feel empowered by it but there's a loneliness and like a, a, a sadness that's that that lurks behind the mask. As soon as you start presenting that mask to the outside world, you retreat behind it. And that's something that was going on with Elizabeth. But I think also something that's a, a huge problem now with young people and social media. Absolutely. Yeah, and if anything, perhaps more of a problem now in the sense that most of the people who would have seen the Armada portrait would have known what Elizabeth really looked like. Whereas now, you know, many more people can see your photo online than necessarily have ever seen you in real life. So they're quite interesting about audience and artifice there. Um, Peter, did you have any thoughts about that question? <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose my work is wholly dependent on l lurching into the past to, to look for references, but actually there isn't much there. So I'm often feeling in the dark for reference points and uh, so much of my work is about imagination. So it's about trying to create a history where... Uh, it hasn't been documented. So John Blank is our only um, Tudor, Black Tudor, and uh, I can't just keep recreating John Blank. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I had to look elsewhere, and I had to find other ways to imagine who these people might have been or who they might have become had they not um, been forced to uh, perform in a Scottish court or um, or be at a parade in, in Catalonia. Uh, so it's a, a case of creating a narrative that, that means something to who I am and that the layers of history that uh, mean that I've ended up living in this country today. And uh, and on uh, Windrush Day of all days, it, it feels uh, apt to be talking about this and those layers of migration and identity building. Um, and I suppose that... Uh, yeah, when there are only fragments in in history, you have to make something of them and uh, something that is meaningful. Thank you. Yeah, Emily. I just wanted to pick up on what Matt said about it being seen as unfashionable, because when the Singh twins were at art school here in the early 90s, they were looking at Indian miniature painting and Tudor art 
and Victorian illustration, like Aubrey Beardsley. And their tutors told them in no uncertain terms that they were, this was backward, this was outdated, this was irrelevant, this is not what you should be doing. You need to be looking at the, you know, great white male artists of the 20th and 21st century. Um, For them, you know, all these different art forms just brought them into looking at new themes, new styles, new media that they wouldn't have otherwise looked at. And I think, you know, they really use this inherited imagery as shorthand for you know wider themes, but it, and so it can bring this you know, serious critical narrative, but also a real sense of playfulness, which I think comes across in all the works as well. And it's nice to look at, I think, as the other <laughs> is the other thing as the elephant in the room. Is you know I think um, it's actually it's a different variety, you know, color, all these things are actually quite fun for us as as the viewers as well. Um, so actually, that leads on to my my next question, which is sort of, are there aspects of Tudor art that particularly appeal um, to you as artists or perhaps you as a curator who thinks cross periods? Well, I asked the twins this and the first <laughs> thing was, what's not to like? <laughs> we love every aspect of Tudor art, the craftsmanship, the exquisite detail, the symbolism and the social slash political documentation. They said, for us, it's the perfect combination of what defines great art as something that has the power to inspire, inform, engage and move its audience in different ways. I think that's very nice to hear as a Tudor art historian who feels like I'm constantly having to persuade people that, you know, it, yes, it looks funny, but it's still worth studying. Great. <laughs> I think there are a lot of parallels between like Elizabethan art and you know, Indian miniature painting in terms of you know, the flatness, you know, all sorts of things. Absolutely. Symbolism. And yeah, I think it, that's what really appeals. Mm-hmm. I suppose looking at the, the image that it, it's by a German artist, painted in Spain. However, the thing about it that I really love is this sense of movement. And you see that this musician is in motion. And I think that's a key aspect to the to the way the artist has captured this musician. And actually looking at the, the markings, the, the brush strokes on the drums, you see the vibrations, mm. um, which is really exciting for me to feel that, uh, the music there in the image. And um, you even get it through a sense of how his his arms are, uh, how he's physicalized. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think although a lot of the images, I, I've recreated this image, um, which is on the front of my book, and there he is on the back, Christopher the Moor, um, an archer, um, in in Belgium, and and that that is quite quite flat in a way, but um, yeah, it's it's quite interesting to juxtapose the the two and and see that. Thank you. Uh, can I come back with a, a question to you, sure. because of my ignorance of art history? So when you talk about Tudor art, we're talking about like art that's made in this country from the period that we all understand, but obviously it related to art that was happening in the rest of Europe at the same period, but not made in this country, right? So when we talk about Tudor, we're talking about specifically where, even though they have maybe French or Flemish or... or they, yes, they, that's they a come huge here, they make question when studying the art of this period is what counts as Tudor art. That's why I haven't said English art of the 16th century, because, you know, a lot of the best artists were not mm. English. Yeah. Um, I, As far as I'm concerned, if it was here at some point... It counts. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, of course, although, like I said, it's not the period that I'd immediately be drawn to. I go a little bit later. They're, they're, they're two kind of like nakedly propaganda port- pictures for me because they are delivering this information to whereas I prefer to go to s- a little bit later to like maybe something like Caravaggio when you've got a pauper with no shoes on and you can see his dirty feet, but it's still an iconic image. But there's something paradoxical about the fact that he's using somebody, like, I don't know, like a kind of a little thief that he's found on the street. And there's a the debased nature, which is then exalted by the composition and the lighting that is employed in it. So that transcendence that's happening within, within the image as you look at it. But... There is the kind of clockwork, like intense beauty that these Tudor paintings have, the heavily embroidered detail, mm. which is exquisite. And, you know, if I go, if I go to the National Gallery, I could just go and look at one whole barn for quite a long time because there's so much in there and there's such a beautiful 
banquet, but like personally for me, it's not the kind of image that does it. But I, I'm totally like a, a huge. I mean, the Tudors might have agreed. If you, I think, if you took a Tudor person to the, say, the National Portrait Gallery, and you said we've got your best art here, they'd say, well, where are where are the tapestries? You know, um, mm. where's the decorative arts that uh, what we would call the decorative arts? You know, at the, I think the pattern like surfaces that we see in their paintings are absolutely informed by embroidery and woven yeah. materials and craftsmanship. Like that. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Okay. So um what or um maybe better to say, how do you feel Tudor art can teach us about our contemporary culture? <laughs> no, I have some notes from the twins, which are very kind to give them to you. Um as the twins highlighted in their Slaves of Fashion series, um, in which they focus really on the iconography of Tudor art, um, for them it can really he help shed light on the world we live today, mainly through ideas of the foundations of both multiculturalism and racism in British society. And for them, what they really noticed was how little has changed when it comes to the politics of trade and ethical consumerism when they're looking at these paintings, what's depicted in them, and the same debates that we're having today. Mm, absolutely. Thank you. I, uh, it, uh, same as Matt, I, I studied fine art, not history of art. So a lot of my my journey in writing this book and take project has been through encountering a lot of this art for the first time. And so from the specific angle of looking for black subjects in the history of Western art, the ones that I have found have been incredibly uplifting uh, for me to have encountered uh, on this journey of rediscovering black portraiture because I, I didn't know these people existed. And as a music musician, knowing that black musicians were living and working free uh, as well as unfree in in this country is is something that I I think is incredibly <laughs> important for uh, underrepresented uh, musicians in in this country to know. Um, I grew up uh, thinking that I was always the the only black person to have trodden th this path. I, I was told you're the first black singer in this cathedral choir or you're this you're that and and actually knowing that that heritage is there it it, it makes me stand up taller um and it's a, a great source of education for the young people that I work with when I do schools workshops and being able to to talk about these musicians and say that they existed and knowing that John Blank for instance negotiated his pay in <laughs> in that day and age is is really exciting for those young people to hear because he he has agency or all of a sudden, he's not just someone who is in the background, and um, I, I think that's what what I get through from it. I think possibly one of the things it did was to refine and excel at the business of making um, a portrait or an emblem of somebody and demonstrating their prowess their ability to transcend the, the 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 regular public and become something that lived on through art they became an icon uh and like i was talking about before nowadays everybody's doing it but back those they're, they're kind of like the, the armada portraits like the archetypal propaganda portrait they found a way of perfecting this business of, of making an emblem out of a, a human being. And all, all of the things that went on, it wasn't only the, 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 the face and the body and the clothes and the makeup and the jewellery, it's all the other little knickknacks that go into making these pictures, which are all there as little triggers designed to make you think certain things about the person portrayed in the picture. I think that's gone on to be something of you know, significant importance and is is certainly an obsession with a lot of people today about manufacturing their image and presenting a, a particular idealised version of themselves to the public, something that I think they excelled at in the Tudor period. Thank you. Um, so my uh, next question is about this um, interest in re-embodying 
Tudor figures. I mean, Peter obviously particularly, um, and would have been true of um, Chan Sho Bai as well. If he could have been here this evening, you should definitely look at his um, photographs of himself as Elizabeth I if you haven't seen them. Um, and also, I think, an element in your work too, Matt. But I wondered what the implications of this are for the race relatability or perhaps the unrelatability of these Tudor figures you know does it does it help to make them more present or does it somehow perhaps also reiterate their strangeness okay I've got a, <laughs> uh, yeah I know what I hope to have done both in those to make them more present by making it look vulnerable mm. by put the smallpox scarring and the hairs and the bad teeth and it's like some of the accounts that I made some of the uh, material that I used when I was making the picture came from accounts of people who travelled to England and met the Queen and then wrote about the teeth. Obviously, anybody who had like tried it on with an, an actual depiction of her teeth as they looked, damaged by sugar, um, would have been had their pictures burnt and probably executed. So the, the only knowledge we've got about the state that were the teeth were in come from written accounts. And those were all incorporated into the artwork I made. Um, but yeah, that kind of vulnerability of being a human while at the same time projecting these images of like a, a majestic ruler um, are things that I tried to combine inside this same thing by having this mask that showed what a real a kind of vulnerable mortal person would have looked like. Thank you. In opera, we talk about singing in a score. Uh, so you pick up a score, you read the libretto, the text, you then start to learn the notes and you, 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 research the backstory and uh, the same process is at play when I'm recreating the portraits and I, I don't really feel like I know a portrait until I've embodied it and performed the the sitter. Um, so once you sing in a score you start to feel where the contours are and and what is at play between the different characters and although the for instance the figure that you saw is alone the you you sort of imagine the the wider context who who was side by side with him who was ahead of him who was behind him uh, who he'd, who had he spoken to in the morning before what did he have for breakfast and all of these things um are alive in you when you're re-embodying the portrait and i feel for me it it makes them less abstract and more human and and that's what i'm really aiming at all the time trying to humanize the these figures and it's very different to say, looking through quite brutal uh, registers of enslaved people, for instance, from the time, or um, reading accounts that uh, aren't uh, uplifting and uh, derogatory labels that often these images are, are labelled with terms that I, I don't want to, to see or, or hear or have to speak in, in my mouth. So actually putting these, these bodies into my body is a way that I can uh, really connect with them in a way that is more intimate and, and humane. Thank you. Actually, that does lead on to my next question, oh, okay. um, <laughs> which is um, your, your reference to the, the connections with the singing. Yes. Um, it struck me that Tudor artists were not specialists and even someone like Holbein spent a lot of time, you know, making uh, scenery for court events or ephemeral sort of objects, things that, you know, we don't necessarily think of when we now see a lot of Tudor portraiture. And that strikes me as having quite a lot in common with uh, the way that contemporary artists see themselves and the, the many different media that you are now able to sort of range across um, as an artist. And I wondered how that relates to your own practices. Hmm. <laughs> <Got the mic. laughs> yeah. um, uh, it's still really unusual in classical music and in opera for performers to do something different or uh, as well as so uh, often people say oh you have a portfolio career <laughs> which is just say what are you doing why are you doing all these different things and I, I find that, that I need these other things to to sort of feed into my opera work and and what I do in opera feeds into the, the portraiture into the writing into the broadcasting um, and um so I, I, I'm still a bit of a lone sheep in <laughs> in my industry doing this, but I, I really feel in terms of 
my my aim of raising uh, untold stories, marginalized voices, I, I need to spread myself in, in all directions to be able to get that message across and actually um, do the work of, of digging and, and finding the things that sometimes people haven't bothered or um, have, have forgotten about. Cult- the, the cultural memory isn't there. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's about always trying to be useful and I, I have this sort of desire that I, my work should be useful that I'm an artist but it should be useful work and that's what drives me really is. I think the same twins are very similar and they definitely see themselves as lone wolves as well in that um, you know, a lot of their work combines traditional hand-painted techniques inspired by Indian miniature painting but also they work in digital, also they work in film, also they you know, combine poetry in their work. And it all has this very strong narrative elements. And as well, you know, they have a um, sort of not educational mission, but that's part of it. And um, and so, again, like going back to when they were at art school, they were told, this is not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> um, and it's still, you know, it is still rare in the British art scene and the international art scene. And, you know, they do have a unique place in that. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Um, can continue my education into Tudor art. There's like a lot of portraiture, right? I assume one of the reasons is we got rid of the Catholic Church. There's a degree of iconoclasm going on. We certainly didn't want to make a lot of religious subjects. So the artists like, oh, what are we going to do now? So better design like a little jewelry box or a handbag or like a little carpet yeah. of stuff. So it gave them a new freedom, did it? Because we didn't really have the overbearing, oppressive church dictating what an artist did. Uh, there may be an element of that. I think also the the multidisciplinary, for want of a better word, approach of the artists. So Nicholas Hilliard, for example, jewellery designer, trained as a goldsmith, also painted oil portraits, portrait miniatures. And that is in the sort of medieval tradition. So it actually predates the Reformation. I think we do tend to think of portraits as being... Um, more popular as a result of the Reformation, but that's also partly because we're not thinking about um, the many other kinds of art that were available. And I think there's also an element of um, English patrons wanting something very particular from their art, like like you said, the kind of propaganda element, um, that they don't necessarily see the point of a kind of fine, you know, a Caravages kind of poor boy as, you know, they don't, What's that going to do for their image if there's no art market? So, yeah. Uh, Yeah, I mean, for me, it is uh, just very convenient to have multiple formats to work in. And it tends to be that I get an idea that I want to make a work about, for example, why we're addicted to looking at our phones and then I'll like look into it because I don't want to make a work that's just like just such a literal response of screenshotting my Instagram account and printing on some canvas. And so I'll do some research about what went, what's going on there. You know, what's the psychology? Well, what's the principles that these software designers are using to keep us to maximize our attention and keep us locked in? And then I try and find a format that works best for that. Could it be a video projection or an optical illusion or some animatronics or oil painting or charcoal on paper? And I've tried to find the medium that sings the idea in its truest sense. That means that it engages somebody in the way that when people see it, they're, they're starting to think in the way that I kind of want to think because of the subject matter that I'm trying to deal with. Uh, but it's not, I'm like I'm making a big charcoal on paper drawing. Like that's what I was doing today and for the last few days. So it could be as rudimentary as that if it kind of fits with the, with the way I'm working. So for me, that's it. I'm not sure how it relates. I guess if a Tudor artist had to design somewhere to put a jewel box, that jewelry, that book, make a jewel box. So it depends on the job. You know, yeah. if you want to 
want to make the room a bit warmer, you might make a tapestry to hang on the wall. Exactly. So, <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of functional. Yeah, ab- yeah, absolutely. Okay, so one last question from me, and then we'll turn to the floor. So I hope you've all had a chance to think of some things to ask. But um, my final question is about Tudor ideas about originality and creativity, which are very different from those sort of espoused by more recent art movements such as modernism. So for the Tudors, originality comes from a collage-like recombination of previous ideas. And that's across not just in visual art, but also in um, in the sort of academia and in, in uh, religion is that being new is not really desirable in any context so how might that relate to contemporary art practice <laughs> you can have a moment to think <laughs> well as you said at the beginning the same twins um describe their work as past modern rather than postmodern, and so like what you just described is really you know at the core of their work and um but yet yeah, they are you know, uniquely placed doing that at the moment, and you know as a result, probably you know haven't had the you know, national international attention you know, in a you know they don't um, they're not commercial and you know it's it's what they're doing is very different to the mainstream commercial uh, contemporary art world today. Yeah, I suppose it's very much in line with what I'm doing. I, I'm I'm trying to document the intangible and these things that we hold within us, the the heirlooms that I've inherited that I I sort of ignored as a young person. I, I was an interest in the patchwork quilt my grandmother made or the cuckoo stick. I was like, well, that's not much, is it? <laughs> but but now I'm I'm trying to document those things and hold on to the songs that. Um, my ancestors sung and they they are in a way like portraits for for each individual and uh, and those uh, bits of material culture that i i desperately hold on to now and flood my my portraits with they are characters they are motifs and so yeah that that idea of of collage is is crucial to the work thank you well, I think you might have answered the question yourself anyway by saying, but by pointing at the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature of a lot of these artists, which a lot of artists these days share moving between different practices. Um, but I like, like going back to my work, the art with the Armada portrait, the idea was that you represented the Queen as uh, at a certain age, you didn't want her to age because a youthful queen was a stronger queen. When a stronger queen meant a stronger country, her face equaled the strength of the nation. So it's very important that that template was established and you could have this useful kind of flat image, this emblem of what she was and what the country was. And it kind of reminds me of the portraits of Andy Warhol, though I don't think they're that different. I don't know if he was... I mean, I think maybe he did like a Polish thing. It's probably the Byzantine might have been quite big there. I don't think he went to church with Byzantine. I mean, just this this flatness and this kind of turning somebody into the image and them uh, them becoming an icon and outliving the actual physical, like human uh, living, breathing thing that they were becoming image. I think there's a mirror there. Thank you. Right, it's your turn. Do you have any questions uh, in the floor or online? You're welcome to put them in the chat and Rachel will read them out. Hello. Oh, we've already got some questions. Great. Okay. Shreya, do you want to go first? Oh, yeah. Okay, Shreya will start. Sure. Thank you so much for fantastic presentations. Um, I had a question that was formulated really for Peter, but I think it speaks to um, everybody and I, I'm sure Emily will have things to say as well on behalf of the Sing, Sing Twins. Um, I was curious about process, you know, just in terms of, you've talked about it a little bit in response to Christina's questions, mm. um, but process in, in the sense, all the things that go go on behind the scenes, um, yep. who helps you take the pictures, for <laughs> instance, Um <laughs> And and I was curious also about the the way you go into researching your sort of subjects in this case, and then also for Matt, um, thinking about you know the Armada portrait is one example, but also for other works. I was curious about whether you know what kinds of research goes into um, you're talking about written accounts of uh, 
faces and, and encounters. Uh, so maybe if you could talk a little bit more about um, how you make the pieces as well as um, just take us behind the scenes. Yeah, basically. sure. Uh, well, during lockdown, the the process evolved. Uh, and I, I started because it, it was wholly something for myself. I I wanted to feel better. <laughs> um, and, and I very quickly realized that people wanted more of it. So from start to finish, the, the process is, is a performance. It's finding the image that I want to recreate. And then I, I started to, to develop this um this process of using the, the the search terms that I was using in my family history research, uh, the the terms that I was finding to describe certain ancestors, to search for certain images, uh, and so these images end up being loaded with metadata that they're full of tags that I've encountered on my own research into my own past, but also the research into the specific portraits as well. So. All of that work goes on either for uh, a few days or weeks, and then I decide to um, find the props that I'd like to use, uh, which props speak to each other in a certain way, what happens when you put um, a patchwork quilt next to a Union Jack window blind, um, and what does it say to the audience by doing that? And and then once I've assembled the the props, uh, I if there's a costume to make, I'll I'll think about that and uh, whether there's something significant in my past or heritage that I can use to say something um, about the original image. Um, and then it's uh, a case of setting up, um, and all of this is a deep dive. It, it feels like. Um, singing in a way, and when I when I practice, I, I'm in a completely different space um, because I'm I'm breathing in a way that is not like the way I breathe when I, I'm speaking or just sitting watching TV. It's a a whole body um, all the way round experience, um, and this is replicated in the portrait recreations. Um, and uh, in the early days, I'd often appear um, behind a, a, a door uh, and my husband would be working uh, remotely at home uh, and I'd ask him to take the photograph with, with my iPhone 7. Um, so this, this would then be the, the next step in the, the, the process. And uh, we'd set up... Um, often argue because uh, I, I'd be in, in charge of the art direction, obviously. Uh, <laughs> um, um, and um, But that, that was a crucial part of the process because something that I was lacking uh, was that dialogue that you have in the rehearsal room. And I, I rely on that and I rely on my colleagues in opera. And, and in this process, I, I need that as well, that you need a sounding board. Um, we take various images and I like to think of them as all moving that they're, they're still but uh, they have this momentum that is brought about by the fact that I think of them as operatic vignettes they're they're opera scenes they they're the the, the little in-between moments that happen on stage um, and then I'd end up with this whole array of of shots that then I'd I'd choose the one that I was going to post to social media along with the captions uh, based on the research that I'd undertaken anything that resonated with my own family history um, and then wait for the the audience to respond and and uh, obviously as a performer I get a, a bit of a, a thrill when the, the comments are coming in and I'm having to respond and the questions are coming in and uh, so that that's a sort of potted um uh yeah idea of the process yeah i can speak to the twins process um you know they work together on everything they don't have a wider studio it's just the two of them um most of their work start with a huge amount of historic archive and collections research um and then often because there's so much involved in each of the works they'll either divide a series up or you know divide parts of a work up and um you know so one will be working on one part and the other on the other and you know if someone finds something like oh have you looked at this maybe you could add this to the border um and they start with a lot of hand-painted imagery and they scan some archive and other material into the computer to create these sort of mixed and um, with like, 
digitally created plus scanned imagery plus the scanned painted imagery um, and they add different effects on the computers and uh, th that's for some of the digital works which are then sometimes printed as light boxes um, the paints that we saw you know some are just pure paintings there's nothing digital in them um, but yeah it's just the two of them in their studio working together Um, yeah, it varies quite a lot on whatever project that I'm working on, uh, but it's a way of me learning about the world, which is great, because like, if I try and read a book on something, pick it up, maybe it won an award, I don't know, but it's very difficult for me to get any traction with it, to get any interest. But if I'm on a particular subject matter, then everything within that realm is fascinating to me. And it's like you are just like a uh, detective looking for little clues that you can potentially use in the work or like a like a thief, like a burglar, just like sneaking around, just looking for little things, little ideas that you can steal and possibly incorporate into it. And suddenly everything that I'm reading is just alive. It's so vivid because I'm just looking for stuff there that I can that, that can work for me in some capacity. Uh, so there's a lot of reading that goes on on the subject matter, but as every project is different, it depends where I'm reading it and like a work. So an example of the work that I made recently, which was a life-size animatronic stag, but like the kind of the skeleton of a stag, a silver chrome skeleton of a stag, which was like a robot. And that was controlled by a live Twitter feed. And we were uh, finding the most trolled person on Twitter. So the person was abused most negatively. And then we're analyzing their tweets then rating the amount, the intensity of the abuse, and then feeding that signal to the stag, which would respond in a distress manner, depending on the intensity of the incoming abuse. And there's a lot of reading that happened there, which was online. I mean, you don't buy, I did actually buy a book, couple of books on Twitter and social media, but you know, they're out of date four months later, particularly in the last six to eight months. Um, so all the stuff there is online and then I have to learn about whole new things like uh, what sentiment analysis was that I didn't know what it was like a year ago and there's these teams of people and their job is to basically understand how well a company is doing on social media you know where, where what people are liking about the business what people are hating about it what people are talking about etc and their job is just to get just to be able to understand the level of emotion that's being generated by a particular product or a service etc and so then i have to find these sentiment analysts and to get them to do the job and then to understand what's happening with Twitter at the time. And this was just at the point when I started it, when Elon Musk bought the company, suddenly like half the staff left. And suddenly something we needed, which was called the API, which is basically getting under the bonnet of Twitter to get access to a huge volume of tweets, which you can then analyze. Suddenly all of that was shut down. People can pay for access to it, or you can get academic access for study purposes. That was all gone. And then like a week before the exhibition opened, which was two months ago, they... Um, changed all their policy again and we found this workaround that kind of was functioning and then they changed everything again a week before and suddenly we didn't have anything like we had seven days to go before the show opened so you're learning about all that and how it all works and the group learning to like navigate all these kind of strange like data analysts that do this job for a living and at the same time building this robot so looking at how stags move so looking at stags in the wild and looking at videos of them looking at their uh skeleton and how we can break it down how we can simplify in certain points how to introduce certain supporting rods and gears and motors etc to make the whole thing move in a way that worked with the project that I was making and then designing an interface between those two things how the sentiment analysts are going to talk to the the stack there's a, there's a lot of different things going on but it's you know it's a privilege to to have that so you can engage in stuff I'm not that interested in Twitter generally but but because you've got a project that uh, relies quite heavily on it you you engage Great. Any other questions from the floor or online? 
非常 great。Sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> I saw someone leave. Yeah. <laughs> on on the string, the string twins, are they engaged in any digital art like NFTs or creations? Or I don't know. Not what I'm not that I'm aware of,、okay. but I can follow up with them. <laughs> <Yeah> . Thanks, <laughs> great idea. And the question for Pia: Are、um, those portraits of like the Black Europeans?、Mm. You know, Be an interesting question to see, like where their history is and where did they disappear to? I mean, they weren't all expelled. I mean, there must have been the seventy fifth anniversary of Windrush. You know,、yeah. there must have been some form of integration within that、yeah. area. And is that sort of an area where you might like to explore further? Because we see all these images of art in Europe,、mm. but it's mainly black Madonnas and all these like. Religious artifacts, but it's very rare you see actual people in professions and stuff. But it's all just religious art, and you know. Just- yeah, well, well, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's what I've been trying to to show through the book. That yeah, it, it's not just enslaved people; it's people from all walks of what life,、um, high status, low status, in between.、Um, and there's the incredible image from the Doomsday Book of the. The black man hanging on to the letter I, and he was there. And and I, I, yeah, I want people to see these images. And、um, yeah, I, I, they, you don't see them because they they've been sidelined. They're they're marginalised. They're they're not deemed to be important enough to to be included in the canon. But、um, yeah, the, my whole project is dragging them back from the margins into the the conversation. So、um, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. I, I so much enjoyed all your presentations and the discussion. Thank you. It's all been fascinating, and my brain is kind of pinging in lots of ways. I think about lots of things, but、um, I, I, I have a, a, some interest in art history. I was I was a speaker at an earlier event in this series, but I'm really someone with a background in literary history, and I'm just thinking about analogies between the kind of、uh, processes and practices that you've all been talking about and things that have gone on in literary history. Because when I started out.、Um, In the eighties and nineties, you know, there was a lot of questioning of the status of Shakespeare and other canonical authors of their kind of cultural predominance. I was someone very involved in the project, to kind of look beyond the established canon and rediscover、uh, female writers from the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries. And you know, a lot of really good work has gone on to do that.、Uh, I think things have sort of changed over the last sort of ten or twenty years, where now. That good work is still going on to rediscover neglected women writers, to understand more of the kind of work Peter's doing about the presence of、uh, black people in Tudor England, in Tudor culture. You know, it's great that we're understanding a lot of those things that where we look beyond the things we already knew. But I think we've also returned to the things we already knew. You know, we've returned to Shakespeare. So. With Shakespeare and other canonical authors, I think we're thinking a lot about how we can use them in conversations about race, about gender. I was at a symposium this morning on Shakespeare and violence against women, which was very much about not just how Shakespeare depicts violence against women, where he stands on that, but how that can energize conversations we're having now about the the rise in violence against women. How can we kind of you know by using Shakespeare, how can we look at what's happening now, and how can it kind of feed into our thoughts about that? So it seems to me we've got a kind Kind of in, in in literary studies, there's a kind of dual thing going on of looking beyond things we were so familiar with to find things we didn't know about before or had forgotten about and need to know about again. Things we'd neglected, things we'd obscured. But also, we've gone back to the things that we're very familiar with, perhaps over familiar with, and we're looking at them in new ways. And we're thinking, you know, it seems to me you're all doing this. You know, the Sing Twins, you're, you're speaking on their behalf. I understand. You know, that, that this is what all the Artworks we've thought about today are, are, are doing re-engaging with things that we thought we knew so well. We almost weren't able to look at them anymore. We couldn't really see them. We couldn't really get anything out of them. And now we're thinking again about what can we get out of them by looking through today's eyes and thinking about that dialogue between then and now, because they're like a sort of you know we 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 can't. Abandon Shakespeare or portraits of Elizabeth the First because they're like,、um, you know, they're like a kind of embedded language in us, or they're like a kind of, you know, water that our culture swims in. So we have to do something with them. And really active, exciting new things are now going on. And I just wonder if you, if any of you, have a sort of similar sense that there's almost a kind of dual process going on of 
looking beyond the traditional, the can- canonical, the authoritative, but also looking at those central hegemonic traditional things again with new eyes and that actually re-energizing how we think about now. So it's not, it's a very long rambling question. I'm sorry. I don't know if this is the answer, but it's reminded me of one of my favorite novels of the last 10 years, which I don't know if you've read Viper Wine by Hermione Eyre, which I think relates to what we've been talking about and especially your work, because it's a sort of a uh, retelling of you know uh, Van Dyck and the Baroque court, and um, it's really a parable about today's beauty industry as well. So, like Viper Wine um, of the title is like Botox, and it's made of like ground vipers with mare's urine and opium, and I think, and um, and it's like a really wacky, amazing novel that references um, Naomi Campbell and like David Bowie lyrics. But it's doing the same thing. It's like re- it's a like postmodern recreation of you know baroque england with so many historic like very good historic references but making this like contemporary parallel um and that doesn't answer your question but it's i'm just thinking of like parallels in fiction as well um but you know personally i think sometimes like we have done there is a lot of revisionist going on but i think certainly more still needs to be done. I keep thinking of um, you know, Hampton Court Palace and using Henry VIII as the poster boy for Hampton Court Palace. And I think, I'm not, you know, um, you know, are we okay with that? Uh, <laughs> was, you know, um, You're right, Woolsey should get a look in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I immediately go back to opera and um, what opera companies directors are doing with Othello, uh, Verdi's opera, but also the magic flute, which is something that... Uh, there's a black character in the magic flute, an enslaved man, but often uh, he isn't recognized as being a black man in modern productions. It seems to be easier to avoid this and present him as being uh, a naughty man or um, or evil. Um, and I think Mozart's decision to to put this character in the opera is such a crucial one to understanding uh, what was happening at the time. Uh, Vienna was a place where there was a black presence. There were human zoos. Uh, black people were were being stuffed um, that, that had worked at the court and being displayed around the city. And he was responding to this. And um, I think there are ways we can approach these canonical works. Uh, that that frame this history and uh, allow us to have a dialogue that is meaningful today, rather than uh, completely um, cleansing these works of uh, the references. And um, I, so I'm I'm all for reframing and really ripping these canonical works apart, uh, alongside doing the work that that looks for the the voices and the stories that haven't been told. Um, so I I find it a really exciting kind of um, to and fro throw that is yeah I, I think is really necessary and yeah uh, I think that was very well said I couldn't really like kind of improve on that um, I mean there's like a there's like a whole different debate in these questions right and there's like another part of it is is like if we if we learn in retrospect that a particular artist or writer or whoever happened to have been a bad person do we then have to acknowledge that his work or do we have to decide that his work isn't worth looking at or reading and does that have a have a role to play i mean i don't think i'm going to go into that particular thorny issue but it is going on in the visual arts now massively revisionism um but Picasso will still be rolled out for a big show. But I mean, Picasso did make some, you know, he he ploughed a furrow and he did he did make some, you know, very significant artwork. So I don't think he should be banished just because he had to be a bit of a rogue and um a man. Um but it yeah, it, it's going on and it's good. And I think reframing rather than destroying iconic works is, uh, is more interesting as well as more uh, fruitful way to go. Great. I think we have time for one quick question online. Yes. 
Right. Um, this is a question specifically for Peter, and the answer may well be by my book. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> someone online um, was asking if you've seen, seen um, Van Dyke's portraits of black subjects, um, if he had any insight into their lives, or if it was something you'd examined. Uh, it, it's not, actually. Yeah. Oh, the great. next book. Next book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on that, my friend Siddharth Shra has written a really good article about the Blackamoor, and he starts with Van Dyke. So. <laughs> great <laughs> okay thank you very much everyone and um, that's terrific I think we've had a really interesting discussion and thank you very much for the contributions from the floor as well you may now join us next door if you're in the room sadly not if you're online for um wine and nibbles obviously if you're online you may go to your kitchen now <laughs> um thank you very much everyone um and a round of applause again. <laughs>